Um, so I have nothing to disclose except for the fact that I get incredibly anxious standing in front of people I know. I would rather talk in front of 3,000 people that I've never seen before and will never meet again than on the 30 people that are sitting here right now. So um, you're going to see me use my notes. I usually don't have notes up in front of me, but really it's just because you guys all make me nervous. Another disclosure, this is stuff that I really geek out over. I really enjoy talking about pedagogy. I enjoy talking about um, how, how we kind of can further our learners. We're all in the same field, right? We're all OBGYNs. We're just at different times in our careers. And so this is important for where, wherever you are, either starting out or some of us at the very end. So I found this quote. I think it's very interesting. This is written by Richard B. Friedman, who is a geriatrician here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he was talking about writing letters of recommendation. In this land, about a tenth of the inhabitants are among the finest I have ever worked with. A full quarter are outstanding, and almost all are in the upper quarter. Everyone is a pleasure to work with, has excellent initiative, is enthusiastic and conscientious, and possesses an above average fund of knowledge. And this was written in 1983, published, like I said, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And Dr. Friedman wrote this in response to having reviewed a tome of letters for application for the internal medicine residency. And he was reflecting back that over the past several years, he had been part of the admitting classes. And in the last class that they admitted with very similar tone to the letters, they let three residents go within the first six months because of issues of professionalism. And that he really felt that the letters of recommendation were not really adding anything to the application process. And in 1983, he had three recommendations, three things to consider. One, developing standardized letters of recommendation, Hmm. internal medicine, emergency medicine, and OB have just implemented those in the last five years. Two, have standards letters of recommendation written by a cohort of faculty members at an institution so that the same people are writing letters in regard to the students. And three, to just do away with letters all, all together and just base application on, on merits on the CV. So what he requested is that we, as with letter writers, as people who assess learners, that we commit to the truth that we would start looking at what we're writing and really being honest about who we are promoting for a certain job. So the objectives of this talk, we're gonna review the histories of letters of recommendation. We'll delineate roles of the letter writer, discuss competency domains as part of letter emphasis and practice components of letter writing. I know I've got about 40 minutes and everyone's attention is gone. So this is gonna be fairly kind of quick and focused as we move through. And after this a session, um, you will all have get access to a box link that will have the slides. It will also have letter of recommendation templates, some of the literature, as well as phraseology to use. So that's the whole point of this, right? To have something to take away. So as far as the history of letters of recommendation, in the time of the ancient Greek, the letter of recommendation was actually an ascribed form of communication. Given the term, a literae commendatace, which in just straight out means letter of commendation. And it was written by philosophers, in this case of Cicero or masters in honor of their students to gain new patrons. And it was more about the letter writer than the actual characteristics or the abilities of the students of the applicant. Um, it, in the 19th century, letters were transitioned to focus more on the attributes of the candidate and then as time progressed, really on the accomplishments of the, the letter writers, of, of the applicants. Um, and really what's important is that the letters, you can write things that you can't necessarily get out of a transcript. You can say, you know, this candidate is really excellent. They wrote a wonderful thesis in the setting of a pandemic where they didn't have as much support as people in the past, as candidates in the past. Or you can address special circumstances that learners had. The other thing we have to be mindful though, is that we need to maintain our dignity as letter writers and not being overly flamboyant or overly praiseworthy where our applicants don't necessarily deserve it. So me being the naive person that I am, was really surprised to find that we transitioned then about a hundred years ago as letters of recommendations, as tools of gatekeeping. Jerome Carable wrote in 2005, published a book called The Chosen, The Hidden History of Admission and Exclusion at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And 
In the 1920s, the leaders of these three major institutions decided that they were admitting too many Jewish candidates to the graduate school. And so to limit their applications and limit the number of admissions, they decided to institute the letters of recommendation where they were really focused on who the letter writer was and who the receiving person was. So a quote from the book, the centerpiece of the new system was the personal letter of recommendation, especially those from trusted sources, such as alumni, headmasters, or teachers from the leading feeder schools. So we went from a letter of recommendation, which really espoused the attributes of the candidate and their achievements to being a gatekeeper. And we know, you know, if we look at historically, even since that time in the 1990s, with Asian um, student admissions within the, the Ivy Leagues, this is, this is an ongoing issue with letters of recommendation. So it's really important to be mindful of the bias and the history when we are providing these letters to our students and colleagues. And then, of course, Reddit, right? So this is still relevant. I downloaded this the beginning of October, and this is a comment from a Reddit user talking about selection bias. Students are choosing who write them letters. You can, be there, you can bet they're choosing professors that they know already like them. And then also it's systemic bias. I can't identify a common practice that perpetuate old boys networks more than the letters of recommendation. So that's the perception of what we're working for. And if you think about it, right, we're all told when you apply to medical school, when you apply to graduate school, when you apply to residency, you need three letters of recommendation. When I go up for promotion, as a faculty member, I need letters of recommendation, not only from people that know me, but from national experts, arm's length letters. So we hold a lot of stock in this process on our letters of recommendation. So the whole, we've kind of talked about it, the history is fraught with contraindications. Really the letter often has very little to do with the student's performance or their, their uh, what they've done well with in the past. It's impacted by the writing ability and the reputation of the recommender. I'm always very aware what my signature says on the bottom of the letter when I'm sending it out on behalf of students. And it really also comes down to the resources and experiences of the writer and how much support they have in putting the letters together. Okay. Questions, comments? No, oh, keep talking, yes. So knowing this, how do you approach writing a letter or writing comments for a learner? And this is great role play, right? Why were you asked? Are you someone's teacher? Are you their coach? Have you served a role as mentor? And what your role has been in the past really impacts on, on what you can comment to and what you should comment to in a letter of recommendation. And then if you do say yes, and there are times when you say no, how do you start writing a letter? So teacher. Right, this is the role that most of us are familiar with. A teacher is someone who has a prescribed amount of information or skill set that they need to get across to a set of learners, and they need to make sure that the learners by the end of the interaction are able to function independently and understand, can apply what they've learned to the clinical situation or to a real life situation. The teacher asks directive questions to, under, to know that their learner has direct understanding. They seek specific answers. And the interactions are awfully highly structured. I think about uh, the first couple of years of medical school where you're sitting in a classroom and you're given a syllabus and you know exactly what you need to learn. I think about the didactics, right, that we have on Thursday morning for the residents, what I sit in when I go to faculty development or my HIPAA compliance forms that I have to do, right? We're constantly being taught and then ask very discreet questions to document master of masterfulness of that knowledge. And it's basically scaffolded on past learning. What I bring to the interaction really um, dictates what I can take and where I start learning from and what I can take after the interaction. So teacher. And if you think about that, that's a really hard role, I think, to write a letter of recommendation in because it's very developmental and it's not necessarily focused on the big picture, on the outcomes of the learner. A coach, this is the role I feel most comfortable in. And I think what we do the most, it's taking that knowledge base, that skill base, and helping the learner, the candidate, translate it into different settings. It's really improv. I always thought physicians, wait, we should also take a class in improv. There's so many times when I go in to counsel a patient and I know exactly what I'm gonna say and I know exactly how the patient's gonna respond. And then they do something completely different and I have to pivot and change, right? 
And coaching is what I think we do the best. I think about teaching in the operating room. I know everyone that we work with has a certain skill level and our job as coaches to help them apply those skills to a constant changing environment and changing expectations and to adapt and move as required. A coach also uses more of the input from the learner, from the person that they're, they're interacting with to define what the outcomes are going to look like. And I think this is really the best, for me, the easiest role from Rich to write a letter of recommendation because I've watched development over time. I can speak to the facility of application of knowledge. There's more that I can add in regard to successful and adaptation to a new environment than I could if I'm just a straight teacher. And then the final role, and I realize, right, this is letter writing according to Kathy Stewart. So I get to say what I want to say, and you're learning what I want to say. So this is my perspective on this, right? Mentorship is kind of what I see as the kind of the top level of inter interaction. Mentors are often either assigned or chosen, um, assigned in the setting of an academic institution. I have a mentor committee. I have mentors that have been assigned to me, but I also have mentors that I just work with as time goes on who help me develop as a practitioner and also as a person. What the mentee brings to the relationship is kind of a goal of what they want their future to look like. And the mentor uses their expertise and their gray hair to help figure out how the mentee can develop and build the career that they want, be it both interpersonally, academically, whatever, become the full package, the full person that they want to be. It should not be a supervisor. And initial assessment is not necessary the person where they are, and it's more of a give and take. The mentor learns things from the mentee and vice versa. I think this is a really difficult role in which to write a letter of recommendation because you know too much and you're too close. So when I've been asked to write letters for mentees, I, I very specifically have to sit down and I'll talk with Natalie Durst, who's our admin in our department, other people, and have them read the letters to make sure that I'm not breaching any confidentialities and that I'm being truly objective enough in my letters. So the ideal role, again, is coach. I think the residents are great at writing comments for our students because that's really where you are. You're teaching them, but then you're also watching the students apply what you've taught them in clinical environments and how quickly they can adapt. So the takeaway from this portion is coaching really gives you the best um, I think is the easiest position from which to write a solid letter of recommendation because you know enough, but you're not too emotionally involved. And again, kind of as talking, the learner responsibility changes too as those interactions go, go through, right? When, when you're in a teaching relationship, I just come, you've seen those cartoons with like the open brain. I love Calvin and Hobbes where the teacher just kind of shoves the knowledge in the head and then he goes off and has learned whatever he needs to learn. And in the mentorship, you really, it's a give and take and a coach and a coaching relationship, the learner has an idea of what they want to get out of the interaction. Okay, so transition. Anyone who knows what this is? Dr. Landry? You're everything badger. <laughs> um, so yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, this is Reg Dab the Badger in 1948. This is before Bucky Badger was invented, the year before Bucky Badger was invented. Before Reg Dab, they actually had a badger out on the field and he caused so much injury to the cheerleaders and the football players because he was so mean that they decided to transition to a raccoon. Actually said that he was a badger in a raccoon coat he lasted for a year and Bucky Badger was built. So that's my, my UW uh, trivia. So that's Reg Dab. He was retired, both, both uh, the original Badger and the raccoon went to the Vila Zoo. All right, so <laughs> writing letters of recommendation. First, you have to commit, yes or no. Are you gonna write the letter? There are times when I say no. If I have not had a meaningful interaction, like not been with a student for a week on the floor, if I've not done a research project, I, I have a phrase like, I'm so sorry, I can't write you a strong letter of recommendation because I only write letters for students I work with an IAI on, or, you know, so that you have a stock. And if you can't write a strong letter, say so, because there's lukewarm opinions come across, right, in what we write. Um, and only if you can write honestly that you think this person is a great candidate for whatever position they're applying to. And the other key is to apply in a timely fashion. 
There are times when I have been late in letters of recommendation, right? I'm just being honest. So I probably should have said no. That's okay. Second, ask for information, right? Don't ever go based on recollection. So summative documentation, kind of what happens at the end of an academic career or end of, say, if I was transitioning to a new, a new position, what do I have that actually documents my productivity over the last couple of years. For students, we ask for their transcript so you know what classes they've taken. The Dean's letter or the MSPE kind of showing the support of the institution. And it also kind of gets at some of the things that the students are most interested in and the curriculum vitae, which will have like volunteer experiences, et cetera on that. As far as supporting documents, you can ask for portfolios of work. Um, again, for, for the residents, and you should see the files we have in our offices from letters that patients write us, we say, because that's part that demonstrates our clinical efficacy or clinical um, experience to every lecture I've ever written. There's a PDF of the slides I've given. So document, we all have portfolios of our work and then a personal statement. Why do I think I'm good for the next position? And what's for me as a, someone who does education, what's my educational philosophy? You've all written personal statements, right? I love OBGYN because, right? So it, it gives you a chance to really explain why you are good. And it gives you also a flavor of, of who you're writing the letter for, especially if the last time you interacted with someone was six months ago, right? And then third, identify skills specific to the position. As faculty, we write letters based on four domains, research, teaching, clinical, and administration. And that's how letters of recommendation for residents, for medical students, that's the same framework for fellowships that have been used for many, many years until the ACGME decided, hey, you know what? That's not really helpful because when you're in the beginning part of a career, you don't have a whole lot of research to, to build on and you might not have a teaching philosophy, right? Um, as again, we're all in that phase of development. So what happened in 1999 is the ACGME decided to come up with an accreditation model that looked at competencies. And I don't wanna get the date wrong because I know Dr. Spencer will then come back and said, I say that I used the wrong date. In 2013, the American board published its first set of milestones based on the competency. So I always think of the competency as the domain, the milestone is the skill set that um, OBGYN residents need to fulfill to document progression through a program. And in 19, excuse me, in 2014, all OBGYN residencies implemented specialty specific milestones to advance competency-based assessments. So if you think of it, you've got the, the milestones, you've got the competencies, and so that changes how you write your letter of recommendation. And what I do when I write a letter, I have this actually, this and then a wheel of Bloom's taxonomy, which is like verbs to use on my wall. Dr. <laughs> Landry, thanks. And, um, and then I look at the different domains, right? Patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning and improvement, interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, and systems-based practice. And you can see, this is a great slide. And again, you'll have a copy of these slides to kind of look, hey, if I wanna address professionalism, I might talk about work ethic and motivation. I might talk about diversity and, and response to diversity of patient populations. I might talk specifically professionalism, how the person interacts in an interprofessional team. So this is a great um, document to kind of have, again, since I'm the one giving the talk, the three domains that I focus most on, I figure patient care, medical knowledge, pretty much everyone knows you're given. If you're applying for residency, if you're applying for a job, we know that you've got that covered. So I always look at interpersonal communication skills, professionalism, and practice-based learning and improvement. And practice-based learning and improvement definition-wise, and so I don't mess it up, um, is really a demonstrated ability to investigate and evaluate care of patients to appraise and assimilate scientific evidence. So it's use of new knowledge to apply to patient care and to continuously improve patient care based on constant self-evaluation and lifelong learning. And so those are the three domains I think are the most important, they're most important to me when I'm reading a letter and I'm thinking about bringing someone into a learning environment or a training environment. Those are the three things that are most important um, from, from what, I guess, from who, from my perspective, 
as making a good team member. I've talked to surgical colleagues and their big um, focus is patient care, specifically on skills and skills training and application in the OR. So again, know who you're writing, writing the letter, letter for and know um, what, how that's gonna be applied. And again, just difference formative, really doesn't have a port, part in a letter of recommendation. Formative evaluation talks about gaps and an improving of learning and how that a student can get better. Summative evaluation, which again is the Dean's letter, the transcript, the student's personal statement, really kind of talks about the whole person at the time of the application to the next job. So again, think about using summative evaluation. Formative is not necessarily part of your letter of recommendation. And if you don't remember anything else, the next three slides are the most important. And this is something, you know, we're talking about bias in letters of recommendation. Um, and we're talking about how, how we all carry bias into our interactions and into, into how we recommend um, learners for other positions. This is Dr. Asmit Bere and her colleague Sora Kim. They're both professors and department chairs at the University of California Merced. And they put together kind of a very quick white document based on the University of Arizona's commission on, stat on the status of women on how to write letters of recommendation that avoid racial bias. Looking in the literature, there are not many articles. And again, especially if you go back and read The Chosen, by Dr. Carable, you're kind of like, okay, we're really not being very honest when we look at why we write letters of recommendation, what the roles of letter of recommendation have been in the past. So their recommendations are one, check your bias, no matter who and what your intentions are. Realize that you are susceptible no matter what your background is. And you may not be aware of your implicit biases or ways that they might creep into your recommendations. So keep reading and make absolutely sure you're following these, you know, the tips that we have here. And again, have someone proofread your letters and make sure the intent that you're trying to convey is really what's coming across. Emphasize qualities and achievements. Dr. Barry and Kim both noted that in looking at the application process for faculty members in their departments, that letters of reference for people of color didn't highlight publications or research quality as much as letters that they received for white scholars. So again, remember it has to do about accomplishments and be very you know, succinct in, in highlighting why a person meets the criteria for the job that they are applying to. And again, underscore the candidate's most important qualifications related to the, to the presented opportunity. And another white sheet, and I'll have this up here too, is the University of Arizona Commission on the Status of Women. I already referred to that once. So take time to write a substantial letter. Um, again, in review of letters of recommendations that Dr. Barron Kim noted, the letters for applicants of color were shorter and implied less of an interest um, in both in the letter writer and potentially for the candidate in the position that was being applied. So make sure that you write a substantial letter of recommendation. Don't hold back or qualify praise, but be honest. Remember that accomplishment speaks louder, not louder, than effort. Um, so again, accomplishments, skills that people have demonstrated, projects they've led, instead of just the effort to, to achieve professional success. Think hard before sharing personal information. That's the candidate's right to choose to share in their personal letter. If someone is a first generation college graduate, et cetera, that is not for you to, to uh, uncover or to, to state in the letter of recommendation unless the candidate says yes. And that's something when you, after you agree to write a letter of recommendation, meet um, with the person that you're going to write a letter and see if there are things that they would like for you to emphasize or things that are off bounds. And then don't evoke stereotypes. Speaks better English than you would think. I've seen that in a letter of recommendation. And then performance is above what you would expect from someone with their background, right? So just be mindful, be mindful of the terminology that you use, and then also have someone proofread. And then this is the, um, the similar sheet from the gender bias in reference writing, and kind of goes through the same thing, we Re mentioned research publications, make sure that it's professional, write a solid letter of recommendation. And then there's a list of word choices to use. I've used compassionate 
in a letter of recommendation before. Diligent, dedicated, warm. I haven't used warm, but here are the ad adjectives that we should use. Successful, excellent, accomplished, outstanding, skilled, knowledgeable, insightful. I like that one. Resourceful, competent, ambitious, independent, intellectual. And so um, both of these white papers or white sheets, um, again, you'll get in the box link that you'll have those just to kind of refer back to as you write letters or comments for learners. So we're gonna stop here for just a second. All of the residents who are in the room mm -hmm, um, kind of pair up or we can fetch amongst ourselves. So take a look at this phrase. Martha is an amazing student who brought positive energy to the team. That's not really helpful if you read that, right? So how could you rephrase that? If, if people are online or still online and want to type a comment in the chat, please let us know. But how could you rewrite that? I of course have an idea so that talk for a second and then I'll show you what I wrote. So what are you trying to convey, right? That this person has a positive energy, yeah. Yeah, right. So we're saying that the learner is proactive and identifies ways that they can help. Any comments? Yeah, so um, Martha managed a complicated team and did so with enthusiasm and as a team player. And what I came up with is Martha's effort to engage all members of the patient care team fostered a positive work culture. So again, the same idea that, that her actions like built an environment that other people felt comfortable to work in. Okay, one more. At the beginning of the rotation, Kevin had a hard time writing complete assessment and plans as part of an HMP. Once addressed, he improved significantly. Right? What, Jeff? A bit on the nose. Yeah, right, a bit on the nose, exactly. Right, exactly. It's more of a formative comment than a summative comment. So how could you, so if you were a, a teacher, how, how could you transition that to a letter? Yeah. Yeah, so Dr. Landry said, Kevin consistently used feedback to improve performance and excel on the rotation. I hear Kevin demonstrated an ability to incorporate feedback into his daily practice. Your, Dr. Landry's is much more positive than mine. <laughs> All right, so again, it's word choice. And um, you will get, I have, you'll get a letter template. And on that template, there'll also be domains and sentences that can be used in each one of those domains to address certain areas, if that makes sense. So under professionalism, there'll be a series of sentences you can use, comments, et cetera, to help pick out. So now hang with me like the last 10 minutes. You got this. How to write the letter of recommendation, what it really looks like. So the key is whenever doing writing a letter that you use department letterhead or some kind of letterhead that shows where you're from, right? And if it's a medical student, always include the AAMC number so that it's that you make sure we've had points where we've gotten letters for the wrong student in the wrong file. And so you need those numbers to make sure it's correct, right? It's like checking the, the medical record number before you go to the OR, got the right person there. Address it generically, dear program director. And then the couple things that need to be included has waived the right right, that, that the learner, that the person that you're writing the letter for has said, nope, I don't want to see this. And then what your job description and qualifications are. And I think that's really important. You know, I'll say I've been, you know, working with medical students for the past 25 years in the capacity of clerkship director at the unit, whatever, um, so that you can, can kind of document also what your interaction was. I think it, letters actually and comments from residents are much more meaningful because they're hand over fist. You can say, I spent, you know, in the middle of the night when we saw this patient, I think that has validity to it. So make sure to qualify how you know or what your interaction was with a, the with a learner. And then use a superlative if indicated, top 1%, top 10%, again, but be honest, right? Not everyone's in the top 10%. And we write letters for people that are in the bottom half of the class, right, as well. And you can write strong letters, you just leave out, you don't say, well, 
I'm glad they're graduating right now. Um, <laughs> you just leave out the superlatives. And again, for me, it's interpersonal skills, professionalism, and practice-based learning and improvement that I'll focus the first paragraph kind of on. The second paragraph, I make it very clear, especially if I'm writing for a faculty member, I will not review past accomplishments. You have their CV, all 157 pages of it. I'm not going over it again. But I will highlight, especially for, for learners or for residents when I write letters for fellowship, the specific, like the, the research um, projects that people have done, things that have really been significant accomplishments that have distinguished themselves um, during their tenure at your institution. Makes sense. So you want to highlight accomplishments. Also, if you have a story to share, it's great, a short anecdote, but again, make sure it's not about you. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. So again, so that's first paragraph, second paragraph, and I'm very mindful. I'll shrink the font down to 10, 10 font of 10, as opposed to 12 to make sure that I get it all on one page, but I try not to go a bit more than one page. And then your conclusion and again, there are a couple standardized rote conclusions that you can lose as a conclusion paragraphs, but I recommend them without reservation or you know some qualifier there. And then please do not hesitate to call if you actually don't mind having a phone call or an email. And then make sure you have your credentials at the bottom and then a number where to call and don't make it your home cell phone number, right? That's also been in loops before. So letters of recommendation when you follow a template are fairly easy to do. You can kind of pick and choose. Again, if you focus on what domains you want to address, I think it makes it even easier um, rather than writing about everything. And then these are the nine rules pretty much summarized for the letters of recommendation. Explain how you know the applicant with exceptional qualifications and skills. Emphasize key points on the CV, but for the love of Pete, don't restate them. I think most of us are done reading a letter after maybe the first paragraph on a second page. I don't even, ugh. Anyway, um, discuss qualifications and potential, give specific examples. Don't be too brief, but also don't be too verbose. Make the ending statement strong and this contact information. And the key here is proofread. Really have someone else read your letter to make sure you have the right intent for the person. That's okay, and then just so that you know here, um, OBGYN now has had implemented the standards letters of evaluation. And if you go to the APCO sheet, there's a place where you can click it. And then here's the standard. It's interpersonal communication skills, patient care. Again, it's your competencies. And we're asked to rate the learners based on those competencies. So this is a standard letter that is usually filled out. And in our case, it's filled out by, by Laura Jacques and our chair that they use as a recommendation to this for the programs. The key is, if we're doing this, why are we still writing letters of recommendation? Because they're really, they take a lot of effort. And there have been several studies, um, Greenberg et al. looked at letters of recommendation from surgical residents and basically showed that even residents, applicants who were in the top tier had one letter that usually fell out of that realm. So the more letters you have, the more likely you are to truly reflect the potential and the characteristics of the applicant. So that's why we're still writing letters. And then references, good. And these are comments that I've had on letters of recommendation that I've pulled over the past couple of years. Um, Luke, the force is strong with this one. It was a great letter of recommendation. We had to take the leading sentence out. She sparkles, nope, right? She was a workhorse, also nope. Entire package, true gem. Yeah, and these are over the last three years, right? So just, just be mindful that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah, the work ethic, yeah. So any questions or comments? Again, the real take home from this uh, is the, the paper that was published or presented by Drs. Bear and Drs. Kim. And so that's, you'll have a copy of that as well as kind of standard letters of recommendation templates to use and phraseology that can be used, and as well as the slides. So the key in education, right, is take the slides and use them and share them. So whatever institution you go to, now you have a talk, just change the top of the, the banner, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the slow, yeah. Really highly yeah. support. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the now list of what awards are passed in. So the only thing that our students want That type that we're going to see, I think, in January. That too is in your application, but it doesn't take any of them. But at least I want them to be accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the mic. Anything else? Yeah, John. Yeah. And what is, or what would your proposed, I mean, yeah, be honest, but you know, the, it's so tempting to want your students or your right. institution to match as great places. What, how do you resist that temptation? I think knowing that the institutions get feedback from the pro, so our institution sends out letters to program directors halfway through the intern year that says, what do you think of our graduates? And would you rank one of them again? And we get that feedback. So there, there is the kind of the underground discussion um, in, in OBGYN, at least about saying, you know, this program, mm, they're, they're not gonna, they're not gonna play, play it straight. I actually have a question. If yes. the room it's, actually, done. It's, it's done nationally for major programs, they get that feedback. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, this is Jackie. Can you hear me? Hey, Jackie. Um, I know you put some examples of this and I'm selfishly asking you this because I'm trying to write it in a letter <laughs> right now and I don't know how. Um, I think in OB, we really fall into this trap of wanting to use adjectives like nurturing or kind or things like that because it's so important to our field. But how do we do that in a way that's gender neutral? Because I, admittedly, I would have to stop and look at my letter and be like, wait, would I write this about yep. a man? Would I write this about a woman? And I just think that's an easy trap to fall into. Yep. And there's a better way to convey the same point. I often use the word words patient centered or patient focused. If that's any other suggestions, like you know, the candidate is very patient centered, family centered to kind of convey that they are, that they're looking at the full, not only the medical concerns of the patient. Um, and Dr. Landry says shared decision making, attentive to patient concerns. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's great. I just think this is yep. our field is kind of inherently leans toward that because that's what we want, yep. but we also want to make sure we do it in a fair way. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you.